but do we stand for uh, a society that believes in the rule of law and that believes that there are ways of resolving our issues and resolving our problems and that violence and insurrection is not one of the ways to do it and will not be tolerated. And um, I think that is an important consideration today um, on July 27th, 1990. I don't think that we have fully come to terms with that issue. There has been a report that was done on the um, attempted coup. That report um, is available. Um, but I remember I got a request asking if I would be willing to participate in the investigation. I replied immediately and said yes. I would be willing to express my views and thoughts and my experiences, but I never received a call to testify so that whatever I had to say was absent from that report. Um, but so we press on boats against the current, according to F. Scott Fitzgerald, the writer of The Great Gatsby and his narrator in that. Uh, wonderful novel. So we move on to other things. We have Professor John Agard on the line, and um, we are going to have a full discussion this morning uh, about important issues, climate change issues, the challenges, the opportunities, the ecology of the islands, other issues uh, related to that, the opportunities in um, for business, but also the, the challenges of sustainable development in our time. Okay, so um, we are going to go on now to Professor Agard, and we are going to begin this discussion. Morning, Professor Agard, how are you? Uh, morning, Bo. Good to the see you long again. Long time I haven't seen you. Uh, we've been in communication, but I haven't seen you in the flesh for a long time. You look well. <laughs> yes, everything is digitization now, online. The, the hard work doesn't um, stress you out too much, does it? Well, try, trying, trying not to go down. Trying not to? Yes, try, trying to, to, you know, not to go, go down and, and, you know, trying to persist in trying to make the country a better place. Yeah, that's, that's very good. So tell me a little bit about what are the, the, the things that occupy your time and attention now, uh, given your vast field in such a critical area uh, of in our time, really, which is the whole area of climate and its impact the whole business of the ecology of these islands, um, the fact that we are tropical countries affected by climate change in a significant way, the challenge of sustainable development. What are you working on right now that takes up your time and energy? Okay, so there are a number of things. Um, I'm, I'm still I involved. Increases volume. Yeah, can you hear me better now? No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I need, I need a little more volume for, from you. Are you near the, your mic? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, I am. Okay, we'll, we'll try to increase it from here. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So, I'm still involved in the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Okay. Um, in the current assessment, I am still involved. Uh, with the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And I'm also a, a chair in the UN, you know, of the developing the Global Sustainability Development Report. So that's taking up a lot of my time. And there are a number of issues that keep coming up. One of the big ones is climate change related issues. Um, 
particularly with regard to Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago has a bad reputation internationally. For um, It used to have the second highest CO2 emissions per capita, but it's dropped down to, to number three now, where it has the third highest carbon dioxide emissions per capita in the world. Who are um, the other, which are the other two countries? Well, the, um, one of them is uh, Bahrain, which is up at the, up at the top. Yes. Because it's, it's really covered with oil wells and, and sand and palm yes. trees. <laughs> okay. So, but, but anyway, um, in the UN, that matter has been brought up many years ago by China saying, why are you, why are you attacking China? Why you don't talk about Trinidad and Tobago that has a higher emissions than us? Per capita, that is. Right. So, so um, it's, it's given Trinidad and Tobago a little bit of a bad reputation. Although the total emissions of Trinidad and Tobago is a little less than 1% of the global total. But Trinidad and Tobago has to join with the rest of the world in trying to deal with this problem. So one of the issues with Trinidad and Tobago is the fact that uh, Trinidad and Tobago is edging into the hurricane belt. Um, some of these studies have shown that s tropical storms that develop into hurricanes used to happen um, off of uh, south, out, out of um, West Africa, come across the Atlantic, and then they swerve and they hit all of the other islands in the Caribbean when they come across the Atlantic. But because of the climate change, Trinidad and Tobago is edging into the hurricane belt. Um, the, this is very important because Trinidad and Tobago has very heavy infrastructure. It has oil rigs offshore. It has Point Lisas where there are huge plants close to each other. And Trinidad and Tobago could use years of GDP in a matter of hours if it gets hit by a hurricane. Um, so, so it has to deal with these issues uh, very, very uh, carefully and prepare in advance, take preemptive actions, make sure infrastructure is robust, that it can survive, you know, um, hurricane force winds and stuff like this. Yes. So those are, those are some, of, some of the issues that are on, on the uh, agenda. And also take on board the issue of sustainability. So sustainable development is a key issue. So I will I'll just remind that when sustainable development goals were discussed in the UN, and there were 17 sustainable development goals, several countries said that's too much. They should be reduced to five or six. OK, and when they argued about this in the United Nations, they eventually agreed that 17 sustainable development goals was the world that they wanted all the countries wanted, starting from no poverty and zero hunger and gender equality and education for all down to number 17, which is partnerships. You don't know everything. You should have to act along with others to make this actually happen. So, so that's one of the things that um, I'm involved in as well, consulting around the world um, to see how we could bring about this transformative action. So I will stay. I will leave it at that and, and hand over back to you. Yeah. So you are the you are the global chair. Uh, responsibility responsible. You share that chair with someone else, but you yeah. are the global chair of that UN mission, and the objective is sustainability, and the achievement of these sustainability goals and sort of working with countries to see how better we can get there faster. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So we don't want to have an academic report that ends up on the shelf. What we want to do is to end with action, what it needs to be done, and we will present that to the UN General Assembly. So, so that's what we're working on. Um, not academic report, but action-related items of how to actually make this happen. Now, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. You talked about 
the potential for disaster in Trinidad and Tobago and how we need to take preventative action. That is one thing. But the second thing is that these sustainable development goals are related to environmental issues. They are related to uh, inclusion issues for the population, etc. And they are really to make the world a better place in a fundamental way. But there are economic opportunities that derive out of the things that we are concerned about in the environment. Can you speak to some of those issues from our point of view, challenged as we are with the issue of diversification? Yes, so, so this is one of the, the key issues that's emerging. And it's very important for, for young, young people, in fact, the world that's emerging, even, so we spoke about climate change issues, and one of the issues is going towards cleaner energy of solar panels and windmills and stuff like this. Um, so the, the skills that you require are how, how do you repair solar panels, how do you repair windmills and stuff like this that generate renewable energy. That's the world that's unfolding. There are opportunities related with artificial intelligence where one of the learnings out of COVID-19 is the fact that everything is online now. We are online now. And so the skills associated with digitization of everything, even in the in business community of selling things now is you, you make contact and you get curbside pickup right you 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 offer uh products for sale online because the stores are closed out closed down and um so you're going to digitization is a very important issue so Trinidad and Tobago should have been doing this a long time ago um you know the the one of the biggest companies in the world is you know uh, uh, Amazon you know so you order things online and they get delivered even to even to Trinidad and Tobago. So, so, so everybody has to go in that line of digitization where you can go online and sell products and not because the, the store is closed down that nobody can buy anything, can be delivered to you or you can p uh, pick up somewhere. And so, uh, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that are unfolding. And also artificial intelligence where um, we now computers are replacing many jobs because of the use of artificial intelligence of anticipating what might happen and one of the things is also related to big data where people are online developing a profile of you they're seeing what sites you're accessing you know what things you're buying and they're creating a profile of you and then they target you with ads of, of the things that they know that you're interested in so, 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 so the world that's emerging is digitization and online selling and online opportunities and all the skills associated with that are, are the kinds of job skills where young people in particular will get jobs, you know, when they have those, those skills. I had the minister of, uh, responsible for digital transformation here yesterday. Uh, Minister Hasselbacker's, and he was talking about what we were doing. I couldn't pin him down to specific dates on which things would be delivered, except that he said by the end of the year we would get to the unique identifier uh, for every citizen in the country. And we'll try and hold him to that and follow up and see what is happening. Um, but the the um, the digitalization really can lead to the transformation of government here. And it can also lead, if there is good collaboration, with great competitiveness for our business. And more than that, the global reach of our businesses that have something to sell to the world. How is the work that you do related to or, or supportive of this and can help in this process? Yes, well, um, this, this is very important because 
as I mentioned to you, the direction we're heading is action item. Okay? Now, as I said before, Trinidad and Tobago should have been doing this a long time ago. Now, um, since there's a, a ministry in whose primary mission is digitization, that's a, that's a very good, good, good move. Because instead of selling in Trinidad and Tobago, you now need to sell globally, right? That's essentially, you have, you have a marketplace that is global, not, uh, not small. So as you just indicated, it's critical that there be some timelines indicated about how this transformation is, is going to be made and not leave it open-ended. Um, you know, the, the, it's very, very critical that we, um, we don't leave things open-ended. That's yes. one of the problems in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, no end time, no commitment and so forth. Yes, and that is part of the reason why we have difficulty with taking ownership, right? Um, so so a, a plan, in Trinidad and Tobago, of course, the Prime Minister had had a roadmap committee. Yes. But very little of that has actually been instituted. Yes. Well, I, I think one of the problems with the roadmap committee, I mean, I've read two iterations of it, the first one and then the final one. I, I think one of the problems with the roadmap committee is that it address how to get the old economy to kind of recover and focus on some of those things and to see how it, we can get it back to the process of recovery and growth. But I don't, I don't know how much it focused really on building that new economy that we need. There is no way that we can sustain ourselves on the energy. Um, economy anymore. We are an old province. Uh, we can do a lot with manufacturing and services here, and we can build on it and expand, etc. But we have a whole new economy to build, and we have to build that on digitization, digitalization, digital transformation. But we also have to build that on the environment and the sustainability issues, etc. And I don't think that those things were adequately addressed in the roadmap committee if I were to um, make my own input on the matter. Um, you are dealing with things like biodiversity. You are dealing with environmental protection. You're dealing with the blue, blue economy. You are one of the few people in the country um, that you have, you have done work on the entire Caribbean Sea. I think you did a report on that. And you have done a, a, a significant report with other people on the Northern Range, for instance. Um, so tell me a little bit about the economic opportunities, let's say, that can come out of the blue economy. Okay, so let, let, me, just, let me just give you a little story. Um, I, I was asked to chair a meeting at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington. Yes. This was before the Washington, before the lockdown. And when I traveled to Washington, one of the, all of the countries were represented by a minister, and one was a prime minister. That was Mia Motley. So I addressed yeah, well, her first. She doesn't miss a beat, huh? Yes, that's correct. Um, um, so so I, I addressed her first. I said, Minister, Prime Minister Motley, I see you have created a new ministry in which one of the pa part of it is the blue economy ministry, specific. And so her response is that Barbados is not a small island developing state. It's a big ocean state. We have to change the thinking. Yes. We, have, we have 400 times more water than land, and we are going to exploit that water in a sustainable way. We're going after things like ocean thermal energy conversion. I did not know as a lawyer she knew what that was. Okay? Um, so she, in, she then unfolded a number of ideas that Barbados was pursuing, and Barbados is doing that now, and Barbados has been funded 
in the by the Inter-American Development Bank. Okay? Yeah. If you have ideas and you and you make clear commitments, uh, unequivocal commitments, you can get money, can't you? That that's that's correct. It's not that money is short. Is you have to come up with a plan yeah. to convince others to release and that money as a grant, not for not as a loan. Yes, it's grant funding I'm talking about for these things. Um, but tell me something. If you had to suggest two things that we could do in Trinidad and Tobago to help to diversify the economy deriving out of the ocean, um, what would you suggest? Well, okay. So Trinidad and Tobago has gotten quite a lot of wealth out of the ocean before. It has more, more, a little more than 15% more water than land not 400% like Barbados. But, but a lot of the oil rigs and stuff offshore are, are offshore. So it yes. actually has yeah. been getting wealth um, from the oceans. But it, it has to yes. do, yes. So, so we, they, they're also fisheries, for example. And instead of, instead of over harvesting fish, for example, when, when you capture fish, you should convert everything into a product. If you, if, you, if you take off the scales, for example, you could make that into a material where it's chitin. You can make it into a material which you can sell. You know, so, so every part of it, even if you, if you gut it and you take out the guts, you could, you could make that into food for animals and stuff like this, or fertilizers and so forth. Um, you, you can make, for example, there are you, you can make from sargassum, which is coming up on beaches and clogging up beaches, is made into a fertilizer. Um, you can make sargassum. There's a product project at UWE in which sargassum is being made into pla plastics, biodegradable plastics, uh, which you can which you can sell. Okay, so so for example. If you, if you, um, plastic is a major problem, but if you put the plastic after you receive it and you plant it in your garden and it de decays and becomes, turns into fertilizer, um, you could sell quite a lot of that. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so we have to think a little bit dif differently. And uh, let me just give you another little story. I, I have that gentleman coming to talk with me later in the week maybe next week uh -huh. yeah so, so we, we so, will have a conversation about that right okay let, let me just give you another little story so sargassum we can do something with the fish itself yeah. if we took a different approach to it we can do something with uh what about the the biological uh possibilities of the ocean i mean i think you would know something about this Yes. So, so the, there are a lot of related, biological related to energy, for instance. Yes. Well, Trinidad and Tobago is one of the possible places where we have very strong currents, you know, coming along shore. And there was an effort many years ago um, with the Environmental Management Authority in Trinidad and Tobago to see whether you can put in turbines and the, the, the unidirectional current because there's water that comes along the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago. You know, it, it comes out of the Amazon, it goes in a one direction and then turns into the Caribbean Sea. And if you put propellers that can generate energy, right, then the propellers will turn and you can, you can generate energy. But, but, you know, um, none, none of that has been, uh, has been pursued. So, so let me just give you a little story that came out of BP in Trinidad and Tobago and, and Shell. Okay. Those are big energy companies. Of course. They, they said that it's not oil and gas that we sell. It's energy that energy. we sell. Yes, of course. And we are saying... we. The, way, the direction the world is going in is that energy is going to be generated from renewables. So we've made a hard decision 
in which we are going to come out of petrochemicals and, and oil and gas, okay? And um, we, are, we will still be selling you the energy, but it will be from renewables, from solar panels and windmills and stuff like that, okay? Um, so that's a hard decision that they have made globally. So I should tell you that, that um, UE is engaging with, with, with BP and Shell in having a 40 hectare solar energy farm at Orange Grove across the road from Trin City. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, so they are, so, so UE is not putting in any money. Okay. But UE is providing land as part of their equity. Right. And they are going to pay for the 40 hectares of solar panels. Right? So this is in line with the direction that they are going. We'll still be selling you the energy, but it will be renewable. So this is a partnership between UWI and a consortium of Shell and BP working together with UWI. Is that correct? That's, that's correct, yes. So it's a 40-acre solar farm. Correct. Okay. Yes. So at Orange Grove Estate. All right. Well, I'm very glad to hear that because, yes, I know UWI has, I can't remember, but close to 200 acres of land across that highway. And um, it could be used for very, very important things. And I'm glad to hear that it's being used for that. I, um, uh, I, I want to wish you well on the project. And I have no doubt with BP and Shell, they will take it seriously and do it properly. So we'll see what develops out of that. We'll talk to you about that again. And maybe I'll try to get BP and Shell representatives to talk to me about it as well, because that is a very, very important uh, pioneering project for Trinidad and Tobago, but critical to the diversification of the energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay? So I want to um, I want to use, uh, I want to show, you are involved in some other things like uh, carbon sequestration, uh, you work in the swamp. I want to show two videos, one of the beauty of the swamp with the uh, flamingos and the, um, the what do you call them? Um, the scarlet ibis, flamingos and scarlet ibis. I want to show the beauty of this thing. And I also want to show a video of you and the work that you are doing in carbon sequestration in the, um, in the swamp as well, in the Kearney swamp. Okay? Look at this. I mean, you can't pay for this. I've been there a few times. And every time I go, first of all, my, uh, I don't have a blood pressure problem. But I am sure from the time I sit in that little boat and I drive um, into the river as we approach the swampy area, I think my blood pressure goes down. That's the first thing. I'm so calm. And everybody, you can see it in the, in the boat that everybody else is affected in a positive way. And then secondly, when you see this beauty, I mean, it's, although you know it's coming, it's unimaginable, this beauty f that resides right here in Trinidad and Tobago in the Kearney Swamp. So I share that with the citizenry, the population of Trinidad and Tobago, simply so that you will understand that wealth is not money. Wealth are the things that have value in your society that can be monetized. And we can monetize things like that without interfering with the environment. And I want to go now to Professor Agard's video um, in which he is doing some work in the, is it in the Kearney Swamp that you are working there? Yes, I had an idea, and we did work in the Kearney Swamp, but also had to do it in another country, which I went to Jamaica. So you, you, well. it's a Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago project. 
But this sure, video yeah. is focused on Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, let's, right, let's, yeah. let's look at that a little bit. As countries attempt to cut emissions of greenhouse gases to slow climate change, some are turning to trees to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and offset their carbon footprint. To determine how much carbon dioxide the trees remove from the atmosphere, scientists measure the carbon stored or sequestered in wood. But when applied to mangroves with complicated crop roots sticking out, the method for estimating carbon sequestration has flaws until now. I made a funding proposal to the British High Commission in Trinidad and Tobago to test this idea. With the imaging laser scanner device purchased with the funding received, I took students and staff to measure blue carbon, the term for carbon sequestered in coastal ecosystems, in mangroves, in Trinidad and Tobago, and in Jamaica. The new University of the West Indies project collaborated with the Institute of Marine Affairs and the University of Cambridge in the UK. The innovation uses software developed to create a 3D model of the tree to scale, then use other software to strip the leaves from the tree so only the wood is visible. Finally, another piece of software then measures the diameters of the tree, its branches and prop roots at intervals all the way up to the top. This can then precisely measure the amount of carbon sequestered. We're going to deploy um, a device called a side scan LiDAR. Um, it's going to be put around the, the mangrove trees uh, and will be reconstructed in images in uh, three dimensions to scale so that we will then be able to measure in particular what we're interested in which is in the red mangroves behind us the um, very great density of crop roots that are sticking out of the mangroves. In this project we discovered a way to measure the so-called blue carbon stored mangrove trees with an accuracy never before achieved. We have a number of targets. So what we're going to do is deploy the targets around the mangrove and uh, the software is going to allow us to knit all the pictures together by overlapping these targets and we'll be able to reconstruct it in three dimensions. And uh, we have an aspect of this project to do virtual reality so that you could look through your goggles and you could actually walk through the mangroves. So this is, this is done repeatedly for different mangrove trees and um, we, we are also going to analyze um, LiDAR data, which is a laser data, from planes that are flown above as well, who are going to record the height of the trees as we analyze our data. And so we have detailed measurements on the ground, but we also have aerial data as well. Um, and we will try and match the, the two together so that we can then extrapolate the amount of carbon that is sequestered in the trees. And trees do work because trees take carbon dioxide out of the air and you know that's a major problem now with climate change. This innovation is important because of carbon dioxide is the most commonly produced greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change. Trees remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere during the photosynthesis and store carbon in wood in a process called carbon sequestration. Once those trees aren't cut down or burnt, they continue to remove carbon dioxide from the air. Carbon sequestration is therefore a promising method for reducing global climate change and is encouraged in the UNFCC Paris Agreement. And the country can report the carbon sequestered in Trinidad and Tobago as part of its nationally determined contribution or NDC, to reducing the effects of climate change under this agreement. Welcome back. We uh, just saw a video there with uh, uh, Professor John Agard explaining the work that he's doing. John, I really like that video. You know why? Because it has you in a suit uh, speaking intellectually and academically about the work that you are doing. Then it has you in a Jersey, out in the mangrove. It has your students properly outfitted uh, as part of the knowledge system that you are carrying there. It has a number of workers who are helping you, creating an industry around knowledge and research. And obviously, the carbon sequestration research 
has value. It means something. Explain to the ordinary citizen what that means in terms of the whole business of climate change and what it means in the business of uh, transforming the, the, um, the way we approach the whole business of managing um, clean air and sustainability in Trinidad and Tobago and in the world system, in tropical countries? Y yes, so um, I had an idea. You know, as I, I said, the more trees we plant, the better. Yes. But, but mangroves in particular have the highest carbon sequestration. Yes. Right? So um, instead of removing so mangroves... So plant more trees and not chop down the mangroves. The, yes, and we should restore areas that we have be, mangroves have been removed before. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so, so this is this is very important. And let me just tell you that um, we have got, we have been informed by the IDB that they are going to sponsor a project so that we could share this information to the rest of the Caribbean. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, so that will be they, they're going to sponsor give a grant to transfer how we manage to do this to, to form this very accurate approach to actually determining the amount of carbon now individual one of the things that was mentioned was a national determined contribution so on the unfcc website trinidad and tobago submitted um, a proposal as to how it will um, actually reduce its carbon dioxide em emissions. So this and, project um, is directly related to the fact that we are high contribution contributor to CO2 emissions, and it is going to reduce it if we proceed in a certain fashion. Yes, so um, we, we, we are measuring the amount of carbon dioxide that's emitted, but we're not measuring the amount of carbon dioxide that's sequestered. Yes. That is, the more forests you have, they take carbon dioxide out of the air, right, and they put it into the wood. That's the carbon sequestration. Okay, so when we do the arithmetic, we should not only measure the amount of emissions but subtract the amount of carbon dioxide taken out of the air by forests and also and mangroves in particular in, in Trinidad and Tobago. And that would put us in a better place in the world system. And that would put, put us in a better place. So let me just tell you, um, we have another project with NGC in which NGC had hired people from communities to restore forests, to plant forests, okay? And NGC said that they wanted measurement of the amount of carbon sequestered. So we went with them and with um, Forestry Division, Trinidad and Tobago, to measure, right? And they, they then asked us to calculate how much, how much is this percentage of the national determined contribution from Trinidad and Tobago. So, so that's very, very important that they were they're doing the they were doing that. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, well, so, so. Go ahead quickly. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. No. Well, we come into the end, John, and I'm going to have to ask you to give some wrapping up statements. Um, but I just want to commend you for the work that you are doing globally, in which you are looking at this sustainable development issue with the Secretary General under the aegis of the Secretary General of the United Nations. I want to also commend you for the work that you are doing regionally because all this work that you are doing in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica and with the rest of the Caribbean, you are actually making that information available everywhere in the Caribbean. And it also has implications for the tropical world as well, uh, all over the world. Um, and to the extent that these are islands, it also has value for islands all over the world. Um, and the second, the final thing is that you are doing work directly related to Trinidad and Tobago, partnering with institutions like NGC, partnering with Shell, with uh, BP, etc. 
that can be of value to Trinidad and Tobago. And I really want to commend you on that. And I want to say to the uh, population of Trinidad and Tobago, our citizens, that we don't value knowledge in Trinidad and Tobago. We basically look at the university and UTT and those other institutions as some place where people go to school and fellas do research. But development is directly related to knowledge. And unless we understand that, we'll never advance. And you heard some of the projects that can come out of this. So we will see how we can make sense of this and create some more value than it already has. I want to thank you for coming on the program. I ask you to make some closing thoughts, and we have to go quickly in a minute. Okay. Um, well, well, you see, when I go into the field, I take students and young people with me. Yes. So if, if I die, I've told them, they'll know everything. I'm not but, holding anything back. Well, don't go okay. yet, okay? Stay with us a little while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, I'm passing on knowledge to... The, the new generation as baton passing along to them so that they could continue. Okay? So I'm holding nothing back from them. That's a very important to me. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much, Professor John Agard, for the contribution you are making and for agreeing to come on this program. I hope you'll come another time. There are a thousand things that we have not spoken about that are important to the development of Trinidad and Tobago, and we'll have you on again to talk about it. Okay? Thank you Thanks very, very much. much. Yeah. And Take thank care. you, uh, my brothers and sisters, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, for listening and watching. This is MCTV, Multicultural TV. This is uh, U97.5, Multicultural Radio, Hot Like Pepper Radio. And I am Bo Tiwari on Brighter Morning with Bo. We close off now and hand over to Chanel. Al Al Suran for the news. Welcome to Lifetime Solutions, where you can trust your roof to us. Our services include custom fabrication, steel framing, roofing installation, on-site roll forming, roofing maintenance and services. Call 223-ROOF or 223-7663 for a quote today.